Hey, thank you for coming. It's Seth Godin here with you on Facebook Live. And I will confess that I had so much fun last time that we pushed this one up so I could do another one. Today we're going to talk about starting projects. We're going to also answer your questions about the Alt-MBA. And before I do that, I want to take a couple minutes to talk about projects and starting them. Uh, a leading nonprofit did a survey of their employees and asked them, what's your favorite part of projects? Is it starting projects? Is it being in the middle of projects? Or is it finishing projects? And I think you will not be surprised to hear that most people said they like starting projects. Except, and it's a really big except, most people don't actually start projects. We don't start projects because we're confused about the difference between being reckless and being impulsive. That if you are the initiator, the person who starts a project, you're going to have to tell other people. Maybe you'll have to tell people you work with. Maybe you'll have to tell your boss. Maybe you'll have to tell your spouse. Maybe you'll have to tell your coworkers or customers or the outside world. But there is this moment when you need to say to somebody, yeah, I'm starting blank. And in that moment, it is impossible for you to be sure it's going to work. That what we hear the most when people talk to us about being in the Alt-MBA is that they began to see that you cannot do anything that matters, anything creative, anything human, if you wait until you're sure it's going to work. That I like to point out that Henry Ford launched the car, not Henry Ford, sorry, called Carl Daimler uh, at, at Daimler-Benz, the guy who invented the car, uh, Mercedes-Benz. He launched the car when it was against the law to drive a car, when there were no roads and there were no gas stations. This was a stupid time to launch the car. He should have waited until after it was all in place. That Johannes Gutenberg launched the book when there were no bookstores. He launched the book when 93% of the people in Europe he was trying to sell to were illiterate. They didn't know how to read. This seems like a really dumb time to launch the book. Not only that, 15 or 20% of his base needed reading glasses in order to be able to read the letters, and reading glasses hadn't been invented yet. He should have waited. So what we find is a huge chasm. It is the chasm between when we need to launch it in order for it to matter and when we're sure it's going to work. And over and over again, people wait until they're sure it's going to work. And then they are too late. So they end up just being a copycat and not being able to effectively make change happen. So a minute ago, I talked about the difference between reckless and impulsive. Reckless means you're doing stuff you shouldn't do without regard for the consequences, that you are driving 95 in a school zone. That reckless means that you are not being thoughtful about the fact that you might get to do this again. Impulsive, on the other hand, is the only way I know of to get over the leap of it's too soon that we sooner or later do it on impulse. We announce to ourselves, we're going to launch a project. Which project should we launch? Ah, now the tricky part, we have to pick. But we can't pick the perfect one because there isn't a perfect one. We can't pick the one that's gonna work for sure because we don't know which one's gonna work for sure. All we can do is pick the one that works for us the best right now on impulse. And so I would like to think of myself 30 years of projects later, as impulsive. I wait until I got no choice but to launch something because I'm going crazy with boredom or I'm going crazy because I'm not contributing. And then I launch. And I don't launch recklessly because to launch recklessly means you might not get to launch again. You might not get to play again. You might not get, get why am I having trouble with the sentence? You might not be able to make another shot at it. So, yes, we're trying to avoid being reckless, but we're trying to embrace the idea that we can be impulsive, that we can say it out loud, that we can sketch it out, that we can begin. Because it turns out that when you practice, 
you get better and better at beginning. That the act of speaking up helps you speak up. It helps you connect. So the last riff on this, and then I'm going to talk about different ways that we work through the project life cycle, is the game Pictionary. Now, if you've ever played Pictionary, you know how it works. You get a word that you have to communicate to someone else. But instead of acting it out like charades, you have to draw pictures. And you're not allowed to draw letters of the alphabet because you could just write the word. You have to draw pictures. Here is how most people play Pictionary. They play Pictionary by thinking very hard about what they want to draw. Then they draw the best version of what they know how to draw. And then they wait for the other person to guess it. Here's how I play Pictionary. I immediately begin drawing even when I don't know what to draw. And I listen to the person I'm drawing for. As they get closer to what I want, I do more of that. I engage with them in a dialogue. When I'm on the other side, the moment someone picks up the pencil, it's a boat, it's a plane, it's a star, it's a this, it's a this, it's a this, because it's free. It's free to keep guessing. So as you guess, you're engaging with the drawer and progress is being made. It's an impulsive way to play the game, but it is not reckless. Okay, so the rest of the riff here. The middle of the project, that's another word for doing your job. And the end of the project, the part that comes after the dip, that's the hard part. Because when we do a project, sooner or later, we run into the part that's hard. Because if it was easy, we wouldn't need to do the project. Someone would have done it already. So on Tim Ferriss' podcast last week, I talked about this, about getting stuck in the dip and understanding the difference between a dip and a dead end. So we're not going to go into that too much, but that's my riff today on starting, on impulsiveness, and on leaning into it. And one of the things we do a lot in the Alt-MBA is create a safe environment for you to practice generous, impulsive behavior. Because I think that's in short supply, and I'm guessing that you're capable of more of it. So, Sam, did everyone tune off or do we have any questions from the crowd? We have some questions. All right, questions from Sam. And I also have Maya on the board. Mm -hmm. Kelly is up in Toronto. And we say hi to Marie and everybody else. Thanks for tuning in. Go ahead. All right, this is from Liz. So you talk about impulse. Is it that bad in business and in life? What makes impulse not reckless? So thank you for the direct question. So. Isn't impulse bad? And what's the difference between impulse and reckless? Here's what I'm trying to say. It's impulsiveness that gets us to do something. It's our insight that gets us to do the best available option. But we need to do something. So there are plenty of people watching this, or people you know, who have never initiated a project, or haven't initiated a project in a week or a month or a year. And I view that as a waste. Because if you are waiting for the magic moment, I can assure you it has come and it has go, gone. That you are capable of initiating an unbelievable birthday party for your five-year-old. Not to do a birthday party like everybody else has, but to do a project that leads to an amazing birthday party. What's the worst that could happen? Is there reckless behavior in deciding to do a crazy birthday party instead of a normal, boring one? Of course not, because what's the worst that could happen? But first we need the impulse. We need this sense that we're leaning in, leaning in to what might be. Where it becomes reckless is if you mortgage your house so that the birthday party is amazing. Where it becomes reckless is if you think that the birthday party is going to turn around and pay dividends for years to come, because it's not. That part's reckless. It's reckless to put too many chips on the table, to have too big a bet, to imagine that you're going to cut through the world like a thresher, through a wheat field like a hot knife through butter. That's probably not going to happen. But the way you're going to learn that is by small bets, generous bets, generous connection. And it's the impulse to do that that we need. So the tiniest example, you went to a conference last week or a convention. Some people at that conference or convention met 18 new people. They learned about those 18 people. They viewed it as a project. And some people went hoping someone would come over to them and say hi. 
Some people went and said, I don't want to do a reckless thing, so I'm not going to talk to anyone I don't know. Hello? The only reason you go is to talk to people you don't know. Because if you want to talk to people you know, stay home. Because that's where the people you know are. All right. I'm ranting. Sorry. Back to you, Sam. All right. This is from Jordy. You talk about frequency and consistency a lot. Does shipping impulsive projects fight against that goal? Frequency and consistency versus impulsive projects. So again, obviously I've touched a nerve with this word impulsive, and I probably need a better word for it. So if Sam or Maya has a better word for impulsive, I'm happy to hear it. I'm using it from uh, Star Trek. They had two ways to move the ship around, warp drive and the impulse engines. The impulse engines were the ones that got the thing moving. It wasn't scary. It wasn't risky. But if you want the ship to move, you got to use impulse power. Yes, what we seek to do is serve an audience. What we seek to do is connect a tribe. What we seek to do is lead people in a small cohort. And we must bring to those people consistency and frequency. But, and it's a huge but, the thing you did seven years ago is not enough. It doesn't mean that just because Disney World opened in 1980, whatever, that Disney World shouldn't change. They're still seeking to dance with and delight seven-year-olds and their parents. But what it takes to do that now is different than what it took to do it 30 years ago. So should they build a new thing there? Should they have new interactions with the guests? Of course they should. How did those projects begin? They began because one human being, not the CEO, one human being, not Robert Iger, said, I'm going to try to launch something new. That doesn't mean it gets all the way to the end and you spend $40 million on it. It means you started. And that's today's agenda, starting projects. Somebody, probably not the senior vice president of new projects at Disney World, somebody said, I have this impulse to move forward. And then you've got a shot to see if it works. And then you can do it with frequency. And then you can do it with consistency to serve the audience you seek to serve. All right, this one's from Mike. What is your advice on starting a new project with a family member or close friend? Mike wants to know my advice on starting a new project with a family member or close friend. You shouldn't because you're a professional. And professionals understand that they need to have transactions with people who are going to tell them the truth. People that they can learn to trust who have one agenda, which is to make the change you seek to make in the world. And the problem is as soon as you complicate it by working with your spouse or your close friend or your next door neighbor is the truth goes out the window because there's something else going on at the same time. Are there exceptions? Of course there are exceptions. And I adore the exceptions. I think that it's magical to be able to have that work. The best partnership I ever had was with Steve Dennis. He and I... Uh, co-founded with a couple other people, the largest student-run business in the country when we were in college. Well, Steve and I met the very first day of work. They were supposed to hire one person. They hired the two of us. They said, here, take over. They gave us the keys and they left. That mattered because Steve and I had one thing connecting us, which was the project. And if we could be clear with each other about the project, then we could make things move forward. So sure, if you can make it work, please prove me wrong. But I'd rather see you be a successful project leader and initiator and also have good friends and family members. I'm not sure why you need to do both at the same time. All right, this one's from Sue. Why do you believe producing is more important than content? I've learned a ton from research. Why do I think producing is more important than content? I don't. And... I think that research is fabulous when it helps you. Now, let me be really clear here. The number of people who can write is very large. The number of people who have the guts to start a blog is much smaller. The number of people who have the guts to start a blog and turn it into a business is smaller still. So if you are one of those people, you can hire folks who can make your content even better. And I have never suggested that you make junky stuff. 
What I'm saying is the scarce resource is the act of beginning, of raising your hand, of saying, here, I made this. This is what's scarce. It's even more scarce in countries that aren't in North America because culturally, we've been told we need to wait for somebody else to tell us to go. And the shift in our economy in the last 20 years is primarily about the fact that they gave every single person a keyboard that's connected to a billion other people. They gave everybody a microphone. They said, do not wait for John Hammond from Columbia Records to call you. If you want to sing, sing. Do not wait for Sonny Mehta at Knopf to call you. If you want to write, write. If you want to launch, launch. If you want to answer customer service emails for your company for an hour to find out what the customers think, go ahead and do that. That we can launch if we choose. That's in short supply. Does research matter? Of course. My blog post today is about doing your homework, about doing the research, about not being dumb or impulsive or, worst of all, glib. Yeah, you need to do that. But it's an and, it's not an or. All right, this is from Angus. How can I measure if a project is unworthy or I'm just in a dip? So Angus asks a question I get asked a lot for which I do not have a glib answer. Here we go. That's the Hastings Fire Department serving our people. Thank you. Um, I can't give you a map, but I hope I can give you a compass. What's the difference between a dip and a dead end? How do you know if it's worth persisting? So we're not talking about launching anymore. We're talking about when you should quit, because they're different. For me, the simple answer is this. Has anyone else in history ever gotten through to the other side of this particular dip? Now, it's possible that you will be the first one, right? So when the Beatles came along, no group had sold 100 million records. Now, if that was why they were doing it, I would have said, well, if that's why you're doing it, that's a really big long shot. Maybe you should do something else. But they ended up becoming the first one. Now, I don't think John, Paul, George, and Ringo set out to, to get through that part of the dip, but it was seemingly impossible. It's way more likely, though, that if you're working hard in organic chemistry and you say to me, is it worth pushing through this on my path to be a doctor? I could say, yeah, because almost everybody who pushes through organic chemistry that really wants to be a doctor can get to the other side. It's a dip. It's on purpose. There's a path through it. So you've got to look at what's come before you. Who's traveling next to you? Are you completely unique? Again, if you're completely unique and you succeed, I applaud you. But if you're completely unique and you're asking for a guarantee or even a promise, I don't have one for you. Because getting through a dead end and turning it into a dip for the first time ever is quite a challenge. All right, this one's from Bella. The duration of the program is one month. Can you really produce quality anything in a month? So Bella's asking a great question about the Alt-MBA, thank you, which is the Alt-MBA is a four-week workshop. And the question is, can you produce anything of value in four weeks? I guess the question is, really, what does it mean for something to be of value? What we seek to do in the Alt-MBA is change your mind, change the way you see the world, Change how you stand, change your posture, change your default responses. And the way we are able to do that is with projects. Projects and then projects and then projects and then projects. Done in a group, done in semi-public, in a safe environment where you can engage with other people. And what our students tell us is that they have given more feedback in those 30 days than they've given in years of their life. That they have gotten more feedback in those 30 days that was valuable than in their whole life put together. That the idea that someone who cares about you will look you in the eye and give you insight and then you get to do it again tomorrow, that's scarce and it's a profound shift. So I am really confident in telling you that 30 days is enough time. That acting as if over and over and over again for 30 days creates a new habit it brainwashes you into a person that you seek to become. Somebody who realizes that you don't need to be perfect, but you do need to matter. That's what we're trying to help people do. All right, this one's from Samin. 
The Alt MBA itself is a pretty amazing project. What were its greatest challenges? So what were the greatest challenges of the Alt MBA? So again, back to this idea of uh, reckless versus uh, impulsive. One day, I decided this needed to be done. I didn't know how to do it, but I began anyway. Isn't that the way every single project begins? You're not sure how to do it, but you begin anyway. And so it took more than six months of thinking and prototyping and revising and repeating. And, you know, I would bring stuff to Wes Kao and she would give me feedback in the night cycle and then I'd put it in front of other people and they would get feedback. And it was a project. And the hardest part was digging deep into what does it really mean to help make change happen. Not what's already working on the web, not what's already popular, but if I could do anything using the tools that are available, how would I help people level up? Always coming back to that first principle, trusting my audience, trusting the students, that if I built something that really worked, they would show up. Because I can tell you, there was a lot of pressure to build something that was popular, a lot of pressure to build something that would be easy to talk about. That there are so many things we do in the Alt MBA that are difficult to talk about. That we do things like have you uh, fill out an application. If we got rid of the application, a lot more people would come. Because let's face it, you're wondering, will you get in? But we left it there for a reason. Lots of things we do, we put in for a reason. And then after we launched the first one, we're now up to 13th one, over and over again, every single time, working with Kelly and her team, we deconstruct what happened. We fix things. We add things. We improve things. And we cycle because we're in it for the long haul. It's not a fast internet thing. It's a long time commitment. And all of it began because one day, two and a half years ago, I asked myself a what if question. And then I answered it with the passionate, impulsive thought of, let me see. And I could have quit at any time. And I got to tell you, I start lots of projects you've never heard about because I could quit at any time. But the idea of beginning, going down the road, that's important. How are we doing on time, Sam? Um, we have eight minutes. Okay. This one's from Mohammed. Are there any projects you are really excited about now? Uh, Mohammed wants to know, are there any projects I'm really excited about now? I tend to become most excited about other people's projects. There's a lot more people in the world than there is of me. And when I see human beings who say, follow me, when I see human beings saying, I'm starting this, or I'm doing that, or I'm over the hump on this, that's thrilling to me. And so I can't wait to hear what you guys are up to. Feel free to put it in the comments and other people can hear about it too. All right, this one's from George. If you're trying to engineer at Purple Cow, what are the key components you should be looking to bake into the product or service? So George wants to know about purple cows and how to engineer one. So I wrote a book. Ah, here it is. Sam's going to hand it to me. I'm going to show you the way it came. Yep. It's in a milk carton. You can't get this anymore. This was a limited edition, but trust me, there's a book inside. A purple cow is something worth talking about. Now the key word there is worth. Who gets to decide if it's remarkable? I'll give you a hint. It's not you. The person who made it doesn't get to decide if it's remarkable. The person who bought it, who touches it, who finds out about it, they get to decide if it's remarkable. So the challenge we have is to build something with empathy so the person that we seek to serve chooses to tell other people. Why would they do that? How would they do that? Well, that's got to be built into what you do. So think about Twitter or Facebook. Twitter and Facebook grew without any advertising at all. How did they grow? Well, it's simple because they work better if your friends use it too. Twitter works better if people follow you. Facebook works better if your friends are on it. So you told other people because there was something in it for you. Or consider the second most popular music video of all time from Psy, Gangnam Style barely in English. How did it get 2.7 billion views? Well, people who shared it, there wasn't something directly in it for them. They didn't get a check. The video doesn't work better. 
but it felt good to share it. It made you feel like a leader, like an opinion maker, like you had discovered something, made you part of something. So this act of engineering a purple cow begins with intent. Do I even want to do that? Or am I just solving a problem? People need a nut and a bolt, I make nuts and bolts. That used to work great. It doesn't work great anymore. Now what we do is we build things that people will choose to talk about. And I can't tell you in one sentence how to find the empathy to do that. The marketing seminar is about that a lot. But essentially what I wrote about in Purple Cow is that we can do it on purpose. So you can't see my socks, but I'll talk about them because I've been wearing them, not the same pair, of course, for 14 years since the book came out. Little company in Mamaroneck, New York, decides to make socks. And the thing about socks is socks are boring. No one talks about socks. They decide to make socks for 12-year-old girls, a very specific market. Not all 12-year-old girls, just 12-year-old girls with a fashion problem. That subset has a problem, and their problem is they don't have enough to talk about. They can't buy a new dress every day. So what does Little Mismatch do? They make socks in 133 styles, and none of them match. None of them. So when you three, it's, you get three pair, three socks, not three pair, three socks, $10. When you go to school, you say to your friends, hey, you want to see my socks? Because your socks work better if other people see how cool your socks are. And so the word spreads because they built it into the product. Last time I checked, they had done $40 million in revenue selling socks and gloves to 12-year-old girls and one marketing author. All right, this one's from Vicki. What do you think is the most important part of ensuring a project, a project is successful? Employees, leadership, capital, product? Oh, it's a multiple choice question. What is uh, the most important thing to deciding if a project is successful? All right, well, so as we began, every project, every single project that does not start is a failure. Everyone. So we must begin by beginning. But then we have to acknowledge that most projects that start don't succeed. Why is that? I would say it's a combination of two things. One, empathy. You're building it for yourself, not for the person who's going to use it. And two, the persistence and resources to get through the dip. When you hit the hard part, the part where everyone stumbles, do you have a committed team? Do you have the money in the bank? Do you have the time to get through the dip? Because that moment is what separates the things that get finished and work from the things that get abandoned. All right, let's do one or two more. Uh, yeah, we have two minutes. Ready. All right, so let's see. Um, this is from Dan. Uh, you don't show projects. Why is that? Dan wants to know, why don't we show people the projects that we do in the Alt-MBA? So here's a way of thinking about it. If I said to you, hey, Dan, I'm going to a nudist colony next week. Do you want to come? You could say, well, show me some pictures of what it's like at the nudist colony, and then I'll decide. But the thing you have to understand is going to a nudist colony isn't about seeing other people naked. It's about other people seeing you. And looking at a picture will not help you understand that. And the same thing is true about the projects in the Alt-MBA. I could tell you what they are, and then I have to invent new ones, but I could tell you what they are, and you would get nothing out of it. Because the act of knowing what the projects are doesn't help you experience what it is to be seen, what it is to do the work, what it is to launch, what it is to get feedback. It's a process. It's an experience. It's not a textbook. I know how to make a textbook. I know how to make a Medium post, and a blog post, and a video. And if I could change you, and teach you, and inspire you with that alone, I would. That's why I'm here today, to help a little. But the Alt-MBA is special, because the Alt-MBA is something I can't make digital. Because the Alt-MBA is something that just showing you the map does not help you explore the territory. The map and the territory are different. One is just an approximation of the other. So. I got lots of stuff you can do for free. I got lots of stuff you can read for $9. It's great if you don't want to take the Alt-MBA. That's what we say all the time. I am not in it. There is no magic connection to Seth. There are no videos from me teaching you things. It's not what it's for. 
If I can do that in the outside world, and I can, then I will. This is different. This is experiential, and it's designed to change you at a totally different level. Sam's happy? Yeah. Maya, are you happy? Very happy. Okay, thanks. Tell the others. <laughs>